The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, and Ryan Sickler on all your social media. And again, thank you guys. Thank you for supporting this channel. Thank you for supporting this show. Thank you for supporting the guests on this show. You guys are the best fans. Um, it's like when your kids go over for a sleepover, and then when they come back, the parents are like, your children are so well-mannered and so nice. You're like, yeah. That's what I hear about. the the. I, I usually say don't read YouTube comments, but the comments you guys make for these episodes and the guests are just something that changes their lives. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, as I've said, YouTube killed my special. They pulled it out of the algorithm and all that, so you got to go find it. So go look for it. Tell everybody. Support it been a lot of work and a lot of money uh, doing that for YouTube just to say, nah. <laughs> um, if you got to have more, then you got to check out the Patreon. I'm telling you every week about the Patreon because it's the wildest stories. It's the honey do with y'all and y'all have way crazier stories. You just didn't decide to be comedians about it. So we're talking to uh, people who've solved cold cases, who've died and come back, a dude who had a double lung transplant uh, and, and then married the donor's ex-girlfriend, and they just had a kid. Congratulations, by the way. We got the email. Happy for you, dude. You stole, your, you stole that dude's lungs and his girl. Now <laughs> you have his family, you son of a... <laughs> Congrats. It's five bucks. And if you or someone you know has a, a wild story that has to be heard, please submit it to honeydewpodcast at gmail.com. If you're looking for a new podcast to listen to, go listen to my old podcast. I'm telling you, it's the Crab Feast. It's a storytelling podcast. And it's got everybody you know in comedy on it. Bill Burr, Kreischer, Segura, Christina P. Everybody's been on it. It's a seven and a half year library. Go check it out. Um, and come see me on tour, all right? I've got a bunch of dates we're adding for the rest of this year and then a, and a gang of them next year. We're going. My lungs are feeling better. Uh, so uh, this weekend, actually, yeah, June 23rd and 24th, I'll be up in Tacoma, Washington. Where are you at, Tacoma? June 23rd and 24th. I'm there Friday and Saturday. And then July 7th and 8th, Appleton, Wisconsin. Go to t uh, ryansickler.com for tickets. All right. Now you know what we do over here. We highlight the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers. I'm very excited to have this guest on today. First time here on The Honeydew, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Rachel Wolfson. Welcome to The Honeydew, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We've talked about it for a little bit. We have. Um, and then I think you... Caitlin, by the way, thank you. My girl Caitlin hit me up with your number because I never got your info that night. That's and right. I'm off my social media and I think you messaged me on social media. I think that's media. great that you're off on social media. Is that like helped with your mind? Yes. Okay. Maybe yes. I need to do I check that. on it so I know things are going on. I'm there. I'm present with it. I certainly respond, you know, if it's something nice, but I Other was than like, that. no, I can't. I was, I was. Sitting next to my daughter one day, and she's like, Dad, can we play? Can we play? I'm like, I'm going to do this stupid <laughs> post. And I'm like, what the, what the hell am I doing? 30 minutes of my day doing post for what? Yeah. It's a job now. I, I don't like – I personally – this is just me talking about me. I've taken my social media as far as I can. Mm -hmm. It now – like when I laid in the hospital and I had nothing to do but yeah. try to live, I just looked at <laughs> social media apps, and I watched different – trends on this one and music on this one. And I was like, man, this is this is a job mm -hmm. for someone. And it's, you know, you really need someone knows how to do it. And I don't know how to do it. So I think that's like true success is like not being on social media. You know? I agree. There's it's gonna switch. At some point, like all these people are on it. And then at some point, like every culture gets anti, like we're not gonna do that. Right. So social media will be this thing they don't do and they'll figure out another thing. And then it'll come back again. We'll have whatever. to talk to each other in person. Yeah, remember? <laughs> Listen, I really think that, like, I know there's this thing today, at least with a lot of, like, younger girls and older guys. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's because older guys know how to talk to 
women because we didn't have a social media. Like we had to suck it up and walk across the bar <laughs> in front of our friends, knowing nine times out of ten just you're to get rejected, gunned yeah. down. Yes, <laughs> yes. And it builds up a a little bit of a metal. It builds right. up a, a self esteem in a way too. Where you're like, I'm getting used to this now. Like I'm not scared to go over and do it. I think that's what it is. I don't think it's this like. Oh, these daddies or whatever. Right. I just think these guys are like, oh, I just know how to treat you like a person. You're not just someone I go, <laughs> want to bang? No. Swipe, want to bang? No. Swipe, want to bang? I have to talk to you and invest right. time in you and and learn how to tell you who I am and be comfortable with that. It doesn't really exist. Now you that can much get rejected days. by a hundred women on social media. In ten minutes. <laughs> in ten minutes. But you think your statistics though, there's gotta be like at least one or two who like would consider. Yeah. You know, so it it kind of, yeah. That's it. I remember a, a babysitter of mine. She's a beautiful Italian girl. And she said, I finally went online. And I go, show me how many dudes are in no. here. <laughs> and she went like, I thought her skin was going to mm -hmm. fall off her finger. She was scrolling so much. She goes, my guy friend did it. He's got three. Oh, yeah. And I said, so wait. So Mr. Wright could mathematically be in this mix. She's like, uh-huh. I go, but you would have to date. She's like, mm-hmm. I yeah. guess. I started a whole DMs account actually on Instagram based off all the DMs I've received um, pretty much since the movie's come out. It's a collection of humbling moments, really. Um, I have a whole series called Almost Compliments. And I think the best one I got was someone wrote that I'm way too hot to have no ass. <laughs> Yeah, so um, really <laughs> well, took me down a few notches, but I appreciate it. So it was literally a backhanded compliment. So <laughs> I remember um, one of the best I've seen on the spot was Matt Fulcheron. We were at the Irvine Improv, the old Irvine Improv, years ago, and we got done. We were in the lobby, just you know, handing out CDs or whatever <laughs> back in the day. What are those? Right, and this girl <laughs> came up to Matt and she went. You're kind of funny. And on the spot, he went, You're kind of pretty. No. And I mean, boom. Oh my God. Out the door. And yeah. I was like, Oh, Dying. I've never forgotten it. All right. Before we get into what we're going to talk about, thank you again for being here. Please plug, promote everything, Rachel Wolfson. Um, so you can follow me on Instagram at Rachel Wolfson, Twitter at Wolfie Comedy, Venmo at Wolfie Comedy. Then you can follow me. On my website, rachelwolfsoncomedy.com, that has my shows, and I have shows coming up in Tampa and Miami. Miami is July 21st, Tampa is the 23rd, and also Palm Springs or Indio in November. But I'll have spots in between as well, shows and whatnot. So All just right. check my website. And you mentioned you're in Jackass, the latest Jackass. Yeah, that came out. Um, about a year ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Over a year ago. I watched you on my flight because it's the. <laughs> it's on the airplane? Well, it's the. Uh, I had downloaded it oh, okay. on Netflix, but it's not the full movie. What is it? Two point. What is That's it? 4.5. It's basically. That. Yeah. Four point. The point fives are like documentary style and things that couldn't, um, that didn't fit in the movie, but were so good that they had to. It's Do basically like extra it. footage. Yeah. yeah. So what'd you think? I thought it was great. Okay. I mean, I love all those guys yeah. from back in the day, even the CKY and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so I also want to say this because this is a very interesting thing about you. And <laughs> we just call, tried to call Segura outside to tell him because you just said you did YMH. And I was like, God damn it. Because I was going to tell Tom today that I was having you on. Okay. <laughs> and who your mom is yeah. and what your mom did. Mm -hmm. Because Tom and I have this affection for – OJ's uh Simpson's absurdity of with course. the just like why are they asking me about the Murdoch yeah. murders? Well, maybe because you have history with multiple murders. Yeah. Maybe that's a reason. OJ's people are talking opinions. To yeah. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a follower of his Twitter as well. So tell us before we get into your whole life story, tell everybody about your mom and what happened. So um because listen, also I'm interrupting, <laughs> but that's what um introduced me to you is your clip. I think oh, okay. it's at the Laugh Factory yeah, where yeah. you said that. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, who's this girl? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so my connection to OJ is my mom was the presiding judge over his robbery case that took place in Las Vegas. And um, it was uh, – she was the one, yeah, who presided over his case. And the jury sent him to prison for it. I think he got 9 to 33 years and, like, served, I think – I don't know, nine or something. 
Um, did he really do that long? Nine? He actually did that long? I think so, but I don't... Yeah, he didn't do the full... Like yeah. the... Um, Dude's back there stealing his old cleats and shit. He's Yeah, he's out living in Vegas, um, the same town where <laughs> my family lives. And um, so, yeah, that's basically my connection to it. And I just... I have a joke about it, and um, yeah. It's yeah. Just, what is it? Your mom put OJ in prison. So my mom, uh, the uh, my mom was the judge who put OJ Simpson in prison. So basically, OJ Simpson um, got sent to prison by the same woman who sent me to my room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but <laughs> but we got out. So yeah. Here you are. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, tell me about your life growing up then. Um, So I was born and raised in Las Vegas, and um, my parents at the time were both lawyers, and they had a law firm together, criminal defense. Um, They met at the courthouse. My mom was a TV news reporter, and my dad was a prosecutor in the prosecutor's office, and he used to watch my mom on TV, and he said that he was going to marry that woman. And so they would just cross paths at work. Um, My mom would be reporting on stories. My dad would be, you know— Going. Obsessing over her. <laughs> and um, and your mom had no idea this dude liked her like that at first? <laughs> uh, probably not because, you know, it was before social media and mm-hmm. there's, uh, it, you know, you actually had to hit on a woman, mm-hmm. um, most likely at work. <laughs> but they, uh, so they started dating. They got married. My mom, um, before they got married, she went to law school. And then they eventually opened up a law firm together. And my mom, um, she was always um, working in this male-dominated field, such as, like, TV news reporting and then moving on to be a criminal defense attorney. Um, So, yeah, they opened up a law firm together. They had me. um, Then they had my sister. She's four and a half years younger than me. Um, And, yeah, they raised us in Las Vegas. And, um, yeah, that's... What else do you? That's your background. <laughs> That's pretty much yeah. Um, they, I was. Uh, I um. Were you first, a good kid? Were you a good no, student? Were no, you... I was. Uh, I I was diagnosed with ADHD at five. And why? What made your parents look into that? Um, I couldn't sit still. I was a distraction. Um, I, I you know, I couldn't pay attention. Um, I wouldn't listen. I was. Um, defiant and i think a lot of it was i like school i had a hard time concentrating so they had me evaluated and um i was re- originally diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder at well, 5 i've never even heard of that <laughs> it's what called is that odd i oppositional think it's oppositional defiant yeah, disorder i think it like morphed into adhd or something but it's like but is that just saying like i don't want to do this i think honestly i was just one of those kids that got like Obviously, I, I have issues, but I was one of those kids that got medicated really early on stimulants. So um, I was diagnosed with that at five. And then when I was 12, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and put on lithium. Okay, hold on. Let's pause there for a second. <laughs> then does that mean, <clears throat> excuse me, that the initial diagnosis of ADHD was incorrect and all along it was... Um, I don't think so. I think a lot of these diagnoses run um, like together. Parallel. Yeah. So, um, so I was diagnosed bipolar, which ended up being borderline personality disorder, which I got diagnosed in college. And I found out that so ADHD at five at twelve is borderline is bipolar. I'm sorry, bipolar. Mm-hmm. And that was a misdiagnosis, I believe. Oh, it was a, okay. And you believe the ADHD was? No, I think I definitely have ADHD. Okay, so that was accurate. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, I found out when I was older, actually recently, that um, a lot of people, I think, get diagnosed bipolar instead of borderline because um, they like the, I think the doctors or the insurance companies or something can't bill for it. It's like really fucked up. Oh, it's because a there's no money medication thing. you can take for borderline. It's just talk therapy. Oh, is that like right? Like you can get medicated for like let's say you have depression or anxiety, which can run along um, borderline as well. But for borderline specifically, there's no medication for it. So oftentimes they'll diagnose you as bipolar, and yeah, I think that's really messed up. 
I've yeah. se- I've been seeing a lot of like um, discourse on Twitter about other people who've had that same experience. And ultimately, then you're getting medicated for things that you might not have. Right. So I was on lithium at 12, and I developed a thyroid disorder because of it, and I gained a lot of weight, and my mom took me to Weight Watchers. Not thinking about the lithium, thinking about— Well, I, I was at that Well, at that point, um, I had to get tested for thyroid disorder, and it was linked to the lithium because you have to get tested, blood tests every few months if you're on lithium. What does lithium do to you? Um, I think it's like, I think it's like a heavy, like mood stabilizer or antidepressant. Basically, I just remember yeah, what being like remember? zonked out. You do. Yeah. I, there's a lot of like memory gaps in my life where people will tell me something happened and I just have zero memory of it. Cause I was on a lot of medication. Like, um, I was on Seroquel at one point, which is a tranquilizer and yeah. So there's gaps in my memory. And so 12, you're on this, and you mm-hmm. develop a thyroid mm-hmm. issue. Came off the lithium. My thyroid, like, got readjusted. I lost the weight. Um, and, yeah. And then um, I went to – when I was, diag- I was diagnosed at UCLA Medical Center, um, the hospital here, mm-hmm. when I was 12. That's how they diagnosed me. Okay. So how long were you on that lithium? Um, not very long. Okay. Yeah. It was probably like less than a year, um, because I had to come off because of the thyroid. And then you start entering high school Mm -hmm. and are you just on ADHD meds? No, I'm on, um, I'm on ADHD meds and I'm also on antidepressants, mood stabilizers, anti-anxiety. That's a lot Mm. for a kid. And what's it doing to you? Is it helping or is it – what do you say it was doing to you? Do you feel um, like it helped you or do you feel like it hindered you in ways? I think I got, I num- it numbed me out. Um, I think that I – because of the medication that I was on, I, I wasn't able to really process a lot of the issues that were underlying what I was going through. And that's what has come out in my 20s and my 30s. Tell me, what were you going through? <laughs> um, it's a lot of um, – well, with borderline, the basis of it is um, it's a person has unstable moods, behaviors, and relationships. And you think, who doesn't have that, right? But it's really um, not having the emotional regulation and tools to handle the um, those feelings that, you know, other people might be able to – handle. Like for me, when I experience rejection and abandonment, it's end of the world. It's emotions that like, I, I just experience it at such a high level that I have to use tools, whether it be like going to the freezer and getting an ice pack to physically calm those, the, the intensity that I'm feeling. So everyone has those emotions, right? Anger, sadness, whatever. Mine are dialed up to 10. So it's like, it's just basically um, emotional dysregulation, and that leads to a lot of instability in a lot of areas in your life. So, yeah. And the only way to deal with that is talk therapy, a specific talk therapy called so you, DBT. This, what is it? DBT, it stands for Dialectical Behavior Therapy. And it's talk therapy so that when you get triggered, because a lot of these emotions are from a trigger, and then um, there are these tools that you're supposed to implement to handle the emotional dysregulation that you experience when you get triggered. Like something will happen, I'll get triggered, and I'm so emotionally dysregulated that I lose my identity. Um, I, I, like my thoughts are so dark. I'm not able, like, it's good that I have my boyfriend who is so educated on borderline. It's almost, I'm almost scared to sometimes be alone with my thoughts because I need someone there to tell me that that's just my emotions. It's not facts because I get lost in that. So, so you have to, you know, you have to learn how to self-regulate, self-validate, do all these things. And a lot of this is because I didn't learn it as a kid. Mm-hmm. And so. Do you dissociate? Yes. You do? Mm-hmm. For how long? It could be days sometimes. Really? Mm-hmm. And it's Will just. you just curl up in a ball and not communicate? I just like, or, I, I'm just in this. you still drag yourself out and do sets? It's the worst. 
Sometimes I do, and I'm crying right before I get on stage. I'm so in this dark place that I like, sometimes stand up pulls me out. I got to be honest, because sometimes I'm in the, the worst place. I'll be crying. The, even like, I'll, I'll be drying my tears as I walk oh, on no. stage. <laughs> I'm I'll just be like, like Rachel Wilson. Uh, no, you don't even know. Like I, I, that happened at Moon Tower. I was so sad and I walked on stage and it, luckily it was so hot. I was also sweating. So like no one could tell where the moisture was coming from. And, um, and then as soon as that first laugh happens, there's a release inside me. It's the validation that I need that like I'm not giving myself or that I can't in that moment because I'm so emotionally dysregulated. Give me an example of a time that this happened to you where it was really one of your worst. Um, I get triggered a lot um, with, well, for example, in L.A., you know, there's a lacking of stage time. And I think for me, um, I just I got the movie and I was three years into comedy when the movie came out. And so my whole thing was I wanted to be a stand up. I want to master this craft. I want to become a beast. I know it takes, you know, 10,000 hours to be good at something. And then, you know, when the movie came out, I I don't think I I think I I just didn't get as many spots as I thought I would. I thought some of the clubs might open up to me. I still don't have a home club here. And for me, I just um I get really triggered sometimes that um, I, I'm not there yet in L.A. specifically, in the town that I started in and that, um, yeah, I, I basically, I came up in. So sometimes, you know, um, when I, <laughs> I don't get booked or I get the emails and for months I won't get booked, I'll, it'll just, I'll, I'll get really upset about it. And luckily with Matt, He's a paid regular at the store. He's been in the scene. I have someone like that to tell me, like, that this is normal. This is something that everyone goes through, you know. And took me twenty one I know. or two years. Yeah, and 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 Matt, everybody's different. Yeah, and Matt, like, he he has these stories because he's been in it for sixteen years, and he tells me, like, without that, I would just I wouldn't know that this is normal. I wouldn't have someone who's mentoring me because in comedy you need those mentors. Mm -hmm. You need people to sit you down and be like, you know, and 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 um not critique you, but give good feedback and guide you in the direction, you know, like Felipe Esparza is a mentor of mine. Mm -hmm. He started taking me on the road really early and he's just been the best mentor I've ever had. Him and his wife, Lisa, like anytime I have any question about comedy or the business, you know, they're there to, to um, lend an ear or offer guidance. So for me, on top of like the level of like like how I handle rejection and abandonment, because I'm a hustler. When I when I like got into comedy, I hit the ground running five mics a night in LA, like riding every day, getting up as much as I can. And then once the pandemic hit, a lot of those mics disappeared. And I kind of watched the scene in LA really dry up for like newer comics. Mm -hmm. And I before the pandemic, like I said, I was three years in and now I'm seven and I feel like I'm part of this like forgotten class <laughs> where like we're still not headliners per se. Well, I'm, I'm headlining now, but like, you know, we don't get enough of the reps that we should here specifically. So we have to go on the road. We have to go elsewhere, mm -hmm. you know, so it's. It's also OK to do that. Yeah. Listen, a building with your name on it, although it's legendary and fun and great and everything, it doesn't make you who you are or who you aren't either, by the way. Yeah. It doesn't. You go out on the road, you build your hour, you build your fan base, you go out there, and hopefully you get to do some spots in L.A. There's, yeah, I mean, three legit clubs. Mm -hmm. And I'm not including the Laugh Factory. <laughs> Shade. <laughs> in, uh, in L.A. <laughs> And, no, I know. Uh, it's only so many stages and there's a million of us, you know. A hundred percent. And I, I think it takes leaving the scene to realize mm -hmm. how much stage time there is out Everywhere there. Else. And so, you know, I've been I've been stuck in LA for a while because up until the strike happened, I've been shooting um TV and stuff. So I haven't been able to get out on the road as much because Obviously, like I'm not going to just sit around and wait for stage time. But when you're shooting stuff, it's it's more difficult to go on the road. I don't, you know, I don't 
um, yeah, I just, I had to be in town for these last six months plus. And now that that's over and the strike's happening, I'm like, okay, let's get out on the road. And I just got back from Austin and it's so cool to see that scene kind of start. I love and it. there's like 10 comedy clubs there and you can walk and to like walk all, to of, all them. of them. And That's right. I, if I was a, a comedian, especially if I wanted to build the muscle of stand-up comedy and I wasn't already where I am and I didn't have a child that lives here, so I stay here, um, I definitely would go down mm -hmm. there. You can get up and do five I got spots, five spots six a and, night. Yeah. I already saw the comic that I was like, you know, like for me, I need reps. Like mm -hmm. I feel like I've kind of plateaued out here specifically because, you know, there's only so much st stage time to go around. So – Again, I need to be out there. But like, also, not to interrupt you, but when you come here, you're out there, you're working on an hour. Mm -hmm. When you come here, you got to work minutes. yeah, <laughs> seven to 15 mm -hmm. pieces yeah. of your hour. Mm -hmm. So even though you need the reps, you're getting reps on only the chunks you choose to do that night. You're not yeah. getting the reps on that full 45 or an hour, you know? Right. So there's that too, you know? Right. There's a lot of people who can crush 15 and don't have anything beyond that. And so that's why... For me, I I want to, you know, I want to have an hour of really solid jokes. And so um, I'm at a point where now that I have the um, time and I'm able to go out on the road, I'm, I'm much happier with where I am because for a while I felt really stuck being in LA and not being able to like um, work on my standup the way I want to. So let's go back a little bit in time for you and tell me about, you mentioned to me outside about your senior year in mm -hmm. high school. You went to a different school and why, what was it and why did that happen? <laughs> um, so, you know, I was g having behavioral issues since I was a kid and I think it all came to a halt my senior year. I got caught sneaking out of the house and- to do what? Make out with boy. boys and- um. My parents caught me, and at that point, that was kind of like a cry for help. I was um, not doing well mentally, and were you using any drugs or anything at the no. time? Drinking? Mm -mm. No, no. For me, it was all mental, and I just think that you know, my parents they were they just worked really, really hard, and they weren't able to, you know. Um, they didn't give me the emotional tools, I think, because they just, one, I don't know if they even have them. Like I watched the way my grandfather kind of treated my mom and my grandma and my aunts. And I think that gets passed down generationally. And so my mom, to be able to do the jobs that she had, which is be a judge, be a criminal defense attorney, you know, you almost have to be stoic. And that got brought home. So, you know, as a kid, like for me, I just never felt good enough. Like if I didn't get an A, you know, I wouldn't get validated for whatever grade I did get. And so I didn't learn to validate myself. Like even when I played basketball, it was like I wasn't good enough at whatever I did out there. And I know that my parents, that's also a generational thing. Like <laughs> we're kids need to be validated from a young age. We don't need to be babied. We need to be validated. Like I didn't need to be babied, but I did need to feel good about whatever it was that I'm doing. And I think for high achieving parents, it's hard to kind of like, you know, it's kind of hard to give that to a kid because there, no kids high, most of them are not high achieving, you know, and, or, but they, they grow into whatever it is. And so, you know, I struggled with a lot of that. I was very, you know, just I just never felt really good or worthy or um, I didn't have any self-esteem. So I think that I sought that out in boys. And so when I got caught, my parents were concerned and my mom found a school in Utah that was a therapeutic boarding school. It's basically a lockdown. There's bars on the windows. Once For you real? Get, yeah. And they take your shoes when you get there. And once you go, you can't leave until you graduate the program. And they manipulate your parents um, so that they yeah, won't tell come me about it. get you. So, oh, so they'll lie to your parents, telling them you're fine so they don't Well, they're like, this you. is normal. She's going to want to come home. She's going to say this. She's going to say that. And that's normal. 
Hair changes can happen due to age, biology, and lifestyle. So no matter the root cause of your hair concerns, Nutrafol meets you exactly where you are with science-backed formulas tailored to your needs. While Nutrafol's hair growth supplements target the root causes of thinning hair from within, Nutrafol's scalp care formulas help create a healthy environment for improved hair quality. When your scalp is unbalanced or not cared for regularly with the right products, it can become clogged, dry, and irritated, leading to a poor environment for natural hair growth. The shampoo, scalp mask, and scalp essence are each gentle yet effective and work to exfoliate, purify, and balance the scalp for improved hair health. The sulfate and silicone-free shampoo and conditioner are designed to cleanse the scalp without stripping and defend the strands for stronger, more voluminous hair. Take the first step towards improved hair and scalp health now. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our U.S. listeners $10 off your first scalp care order when you go to Nutrafol.com slash scalp and enter promo code HONEYDEW. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash scalp and enter promo code HONEYDEW for $10 off your first scalp care order. This is available only to U.S. customers for a limited time. That's Nutrafol.com slash scalp. Promo code HONEYDEW for $10 off your first scalp care order. There's no quick fix for anxiety and depression. It's not finding a new therapist or starting an exercise routine, not more and regular meditation or a better diet. Sometimes you need something to unlock your brain, a new way of thinking about and seeing the world. Maybe that thing is guided ketamine therapy from Mindbloom. There is a new tool to improve your mental health at home ketamine therapy. Mindbloom is the leader in at-home ketamine therapy, having safely helped thousands of people overcome their anxiety and depression. Unlike traditional talk therapy, ketamine works quickly and doesn't have the unpleasant side effects of traditional antidepressants. In a study of over 1,200 Mindbloom clients, 89% reported improvements in their anxiety and depression after only two sessions. Right now, Mindbloom is offering my listeners $100 off your first six-session program when you sign up at mindbloom.com slash honeydew and use promo code honeydew. Take the first step and break free from your anxiety and depression with Mindbloom. Mindbloom.com slash honeydew and use promo code honeydew. Proper functional hydration is essential, and Liquid IV is the number one powdered hydration brand in America. Their hydration multiplier is the one product you're missing in your daily routine. In just one stick, you're getting five essential vitamins, two times faster hydration than water alone. Use it first thing in the morning, before a workout, when you feel run down, after a long night out, long flights, whatever. All right, I take it on the tour. We're taking it here at the studio. I give it out to friends. I love it. It's it's a great pick me up in the morning. I take it in my water to physical therapy with me. It's money. 12 delicious, refreshing flavors to keep your hydration routine exciting. Contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. Has three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. And it's made with premium ingredients that are non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. Real people, real flavor, real hydrating. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code HONEYDO at checkout. That's 20% off of anything when you shop better hydration today using promo code HONEYDO at liquidiv.com. Now, let's get back to the do. So, um, you know, and then when you get there, so it was. It, my parents found a school is in Provo, Utah, and they took me and and dropped me off, um, which is something that I think about. That it's crazy that they just like took me and dropped me off. They Did didn't. They like, drive you. Mm-hmm. God. And a lot of well, I was one of the lucky ones because a lot of the kids that I went with there, they get what we call escorted, which is when two huge security guards come into your room at night and basically kidnap you. And bring you to the school. What? And then there's out of your home. Out of your home in the middle oh, of the night, fuck. which is so incredibly traumatizing. Yeah. That's how they're coming to get you. You're mm-hmm. sleeping and they grab you and throw so you in the car. So I was one of the lucky gone. ones. Like the whole experience is traumatizing, but to go through that just to get to that, that's something that I think a lot of people who go through that experience is basically illegal kidnapping. It's it's traumatizing. And then there's the other fucked up way that you get there is when your parents tell you you're going on a ski trip and they make you pack your bags and they drop you off at that 
facility. Is that what happened to you? No. Oh, okay. I knew exactly right. where All I was right. going. Okay. I just didn't know what would happen when I got there. <laughs> I'm thinking it's like Harry Potter. I'm going to learn magic. Harry Potter. You know, magic. I'm going to learn spells. Like, you know, I'm going to make out with boys in Utah in these like with these horny Mormons who don't get enough attention. Mm-hmm. No, it was nothing like that. What was it like? <laughs> Uh, a lockdown. It was like basically kid prison. I mean, you when are you, you in a room? The door locks as well. Or you're always watched. You're never alone. You're separated from the boys. You don't have shoes. The first I don't know couple weeks you get there, you have to earn. Um, you, your only communication is for the first two months letters to people your parents pre-approved you could write to, and everything you write gets written re- read, and everything that gets sent to you gets read. So they know everything that's being said in and out of that. Then you, you have roommates. Um, you lit. There's different rooms at the um, school, and depending, on, like I lived in a room that had two, twelve girls in it, bunk beds. Damn. And but there, you know, some rooms had eight, some rooms had a couple. There's different rooms that you live in and give me the range of what people are there for you're there for sneaking out and trouble with boys mm-hmm. and what are some other people drugs there for? addiction um some kids are court ordered there so violent behavior so you're just thrown in with a mm-hmm. hodgepodge of whatever mm-hmm. troubled kids. mental mental issues yeah there it's called tr- troubled youth schools basically troubled teens yeah mm-hmm Okay. So, and they range. So you can go there as young as I, I think the youngest they had there was 13 and then 18. So I went when I was 17 and I turned 18 in Utah. And when you turn 18, so there's a law when you turn 18 in Utah, you can't live, you can't, you you can't be housed with underage kids or something. So they have to put you in the 18 year old house. And you also have to sign your rights away saying that you're not going to leave the school until you graduate the program. That's what I wanted to ask because now you're an adult. So basically what they tell you is if you don't – so your birthday is coming up. They know that you have the option to leave legally or – and if you do leave, they tell you you're going to be homeless and that they're going to call your parents and tell them not to pick you up. The entire town's going to know not to – basically help you. And yeah, they basically say you'll be homeless, but then, and, but so you, so basically if you do sign, you have to stay until you graduate the program. So when did you turn 18 and how many more months before you got out? I got there in November of 2000. Um, I got there in November and I turned 18 January. So I was only um, I was only in the underage for November and December up until January 23rd. And then June, you graduate like regular school or? No, I graduated that December. I, I graduated a whole semester after my class. Holy, so you spent another year there after I that. was there for 13 months total. Man, mm-hmm. what, tell me, tell me what the ride was like with your parents. Were you fighting it? Were you, um, what was it like when they dropped you off? I was just, I think for me, cause so my parents, uh, they sent me to private school in Vegas, but it was private religious school. And it wasn't like, they weren't like college prep. These were schools that were often very indoctrinating. And so I went to pre-K through eighth grade was um, a Jewish school. And then they didn't have a Jewish high school. So my mom sent me to Catholic school my freshman year. And um, uh, I just, I didn't like it there. And my mom sent me there because it was close to work. So it was convenient for her. But I didn't really have any friends because a lot of those kids grew up in the Catholic school system. And I grew up, you know, going to a Jewish school. So it was like I was the new chick, you know, and it was hard Mm -hmm. to make friends. And so – but I had a ton of friends at this Lutheran school (laughs) that was closer to home. So I went there. And that was the school that I left before I got sent to Utah. So I went from Lutheran to Mormon. Oh, it was a Mormon school then. It wasn't a Mormon school. Oh. It was just ran by all Mormons. And there were certain elements that I'm like, oh, they're indoctrinating us. For sure. We dress like we they made us wear these like super long potato sack khaki skirts and like baggy t-shirts. It was like, you know, just 
And, you know, we weren't allowed that, you know, you don't have sex until you're married and, you know, just very Mormon stuff. What was your first night there like? Were you scared? Were you angry? Were you, I saw you visually count the girls in the room, so I know you know what it looks like. Yeah. The first night, well, the first, the first, I don't know, however many months, it was like, a, it was like the first three months I cried myself to sleep pretty much every night. The first night was rough. I was so scared. I remember like just crying myself to sleep like I was in a shock because I, I mean, I went to summer camp, but this was a whole new world that I had just stepped into. And I don't think I knew what it, I, I had no idea what to expect. And then as soon as reality hit and I was like, oh, I, this is my reality for who knows how long. And, um, it really made me appreciate, you know, what I had, even though it wasn't perfect. I think, although this place I personally think is really messed up, I think I needed to go through something like that in some way. You do? I don't know. I think things like that build character and, you know, you're going to be traumatized by life in so many different ways. And it's like, if this is one of the worst things that I've gone through, then good riddance, like, you know, but it, it, it made me who I am and I can't take it back. So, yeah. So what point do you shift in there to where you're like, I can handle this? <sighs> so you really figure it out. You got to fake it to make it kind of thing. Like you really, um, you fight it first because you're just like, this is so messed up. And, um, you know, you really are, you're trying to fight it. You're trying to fight whatever. And you also don't realize like it's kind of not a game, but, you know, who do you trust? There's le there's a level system to this. So it's like, you know, there's girls who are more advanced than you. And there's this kind of thing where if you're doing something wrong, they'll narc on you to make themselves look better. So it's like you also have to learn what all the rules are. There's so many rules. And if you don't follow them, you'll get in trouble. Like what? Um. If you – you can get in trouble for manipulation, meaning like if you don't accept no for an answer and you ask again, that will be a consequence and you'll have to like do homework or work out or clean the tampon boxes or something. Is that what they make you do, that kind of mm -hmm. shit? A lot of cleaning. And so, um, yeah, you have to – you have to do everything they basically say and, you know, if you don't – there's people there who are going to tell on you. <laughs> and do you not see your parents that entire time you're there? Are they allowed you have visitation? To earn, you have to earn visitation. That comes after you um, get more advanced in your program and you earn certain privileges. And one of those is your parents coming to see you. And how often did they get to come see you? Mm, a couple times since I was there for a year, probably a couple times. Yeah. And what was that like? Um, it was hard because it was one of those things where my parents, you could see they were definitely manipulated and there was like nothing I could really say or do because if you try to talk about it like that, they can go to your therapist and say like, she's not working on her program. She wants to get out. She doesn't, you know, so, um, I was, my dad could just see that I was really bummed. I was just not myself, obviously. And I'm in this situation where I feel so alone. Like I feel in a way that my family's kind of abandoned me and turned on me and left me in this place that I'm not really sure is equipped to even be, you know, dealing with kids and their problems. And so I could see my dad. I remember we were at, they took us out to eat, you know, because the, the food kind of sucked where we were. Um, so we, you know, when my parents came to town, they got to take you out and have real food and stuff. Oh, they're allowed to take you out of the building and mm -hmm. have real food? What if they just right there wanted to say, screw it and take you they home? They could. They could. Yeah. Um, and some parents did come get their kids because they figured out this was not okay. There was something going on. Because um, some kids got hurt there. In what ways? One kid got a broom shoved up his ass. What? Yeah. And the mom came and got him. Mm-hmm. So it was some aggressive people in there as well. Then. Yeah. This sounds like a mini prison. It I, I hate to compare it to prison because it it's sounds like, like it. But it is 
it's not a school. <laughs> right. It's a lockdown. Like you yeah. can't leave. There's bars on the windows. Like it looks like a prison. Like as you're a in kid, the middle that's, of nowhere. Like yeah. if you try to get out of there, you're just in the middle of nowhere. As a kid, when you see bars on the windows, that does something to you. You know, it's like you are bad. You're not well, allowed. Especially out. when you're seeing you them need from the to inside be out. kept away from society. You yeah. are bad. You are not like them. You know, it does something. So, yeah, um, my parents took me to out and I just, I was looking down just like this. My dad was like, this is good. This is good for you. This is good for you. You're going to get through this, you know? And so, but there was nothing I could say, you know, I just had to. Cause no matter what you said, they've already been told. They made their mind. They're not, this, I'm going to complete normal. the program. Right. I have to complete the, I have to complete the program to get out. Like there's nothing I can do. I just have to take it. And did you suffer any fights or abuse or anything in there? I didn't I didn't get into any fights. Um they did take me off my medication at one point because a doctor didn't think I was bipolar. And when they took me off the medication, I had a freak out and they put me in this thing called ISU, which is isolated supervision units where they take your bra, they take um they take anything that you could hang yourself with and they basically make you sit on the floor for however many days or days they determine that you have to be in there and it's a closet. It's literally a closet. And what did someone, you do? What was your freak out that made them put you in this? What triggered it is um, I was in school, which the school structure is such a joke, but there's math day and English day and I fucking hate math. I still, I'm like, I, <laughs> I just, I don't understand the language. And I would put off math last. So I wanted to work on English and my teacher, the math teacher didn't want me to do that. And so I, he started to take away my book and that f I freaked the fuck out. And I just, I, I, I don't remember like at this point I was on Seroquel. So, or, you know, I'm coming off whatever that is, but I remember just being out of control, like just out of fucking control. And so they, they, they put me in that isolation unit. And how long were you in there? I think just a day. And but then what? You go back to your regular room? Then you, you know, I think you get, you get in trouble. You get some consequences. You have to talk to your therapist. You know, you have to like, you know, t y you, that'll hurt your program. That'll hurt you advancing. And so you have to stay there longer, essentially. So when you finally get out, mm -hmm. what's it like when your parents come to get you? Are you relieved? Are you pissed? Are you just, what, what are your feelings? Um, so I graduated and technically that's where my high school diploma is from, this school. And so what's it say on your diploma? Um I guess, <laughs> what, I hey, what's the mascot? Uh, <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> the, Y'all the correctional the mascot, facility tigers. The, the mascot you? is a a picture of Ritalin. It's literally <laughs> just a pill. And yeah. <laughs> or the Provo Prozax. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean? Prozac. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Like so, yeah, we uh, <laughs> panic attacks no more. <laughs> like we, you know, that so they they come to get me. I, I have a graduation ceremony, if you will, call it that. Yeah, what was it? What do they do? Are you cap and gown? Yeah, or are you cap really? and gown, but it's like everyone who graduated <laughs> in that like time frame. So it's like a bunch of other kids and your parents come and some of the other students will like read things about you and and then that's it. And so I was only at home for a month before I went off to college in Vermont, which is basically the opposite of Utah. Yeah, I mean, you went way the other way, Vegas and Utah, you went to Vermont. All mm -hmm. right, so what? My So basically when I got out, it was... I mean, I had nightmares for years. Sometimes I still have nightmares. About what? What are you seeing? Um, basically, I'm being dragged by my feet and I'm I'm clawing the ground and they're pulling me into the school. Into the school? Mm -hmm. Not that room, into the whole school. Into the where I entered when yeah. my parents first... And by the way, the school is a, an abandoned church. It's really haunting when you look at it. And they they closed down the school but opened it up under a different name. So it's still there. It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I have nightmares like that. I have nightmares just being there and just like not being able to get out. Yeah. And so 
I was relieved when I first got out. I was still, I was still like, I was one of those like just grateful initially. I was really grateful for just like a private shower, being able to shave my legs. Because if you want to shave, they have to watch you. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So you don't kill yourself or cut yourself. Um, having privacy, that was a big thing. Having just being able to independence, autonomy, being able to go somewhere by myself without having to ask for permission, being able to go to the bathroom whenever I wanted. After every meal, you have to wait an hour so that the people who have learning or um, eating disorders don't throw up or participate in eating that right? disorder so behavior. So you all have to wait. We too. all have to. So just something like that, being able to go to the bathroom when I wanted, was like, oh, this is amazing. So it made you. It did make you appreciate what you had then. Yeah, it did. And the thing is about that place is, again, like for me, it's like I don't I don't I, w I wouldn't take it back. I mean, I wouldn't wish it upon anyone, but I wouldn't take it back. But there are people there who it's all about perspective, right? Like there are people there who came from such a fucked up home life that that place was somehow better. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like really all about perspective, even though what was happening there and what that place is may not be right or correct. It was still better from what they came from. And that was eye opening to me is like seeing like, oh, wow, they're like, we're kind of this like forgotten children, this generation of like kids who were just fed pills and they thought, oh, that'll fix everything. Right. Because our parents' generation, they just didn't talk about feelings, you know, and they didn't really mm -hmm. have the medication. It was like, you'll just get beat. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like that's how you learn how to be a person. And I think that's why a lot of like my parents' generation just emotionally are really fucked up because they weren't allowed to express themselves. Because if guys did that, you're gay. And if women did that, you're crazy. Yeah. So, um, and that's why we are so fucked up as millennials. We don't know how to, for the most part, process our emotions. We're we didn't learn to validate ourselves because our parents didn't get validated. So um, and and I read something where there's there's something like considered like there's obviously generational wealth, but there's also something called like mental wealth. And that's where your parents really and it's not obviously just the parents fault, but, you know, because there's environment versus um, uh, what is it? Biological or bio, whatever, like your environment per versus like what actually happens um like, is it your environment or was it mentally always, were you mentally always going to have that kind I of see. thing? So like what caused it? Was it like, yeah. So anyways, um, I just think that it's not just the parents' fault, but I think that if, if people had better tools to handle their emotions, that's a lot of the reason why um, we have the issues that we have with mental health, I think. We just don't know how to like handle our emotions and process them and emotionally regulate. Have you talked to your parents about that school since? Yeah, we've had conversations. Um, you know, I for me, it's like I don't blame them because I truly know like I, for me, I'm on the side of parents for the most part, are just doing the best they can. I'm not a, I'm not a parent, and that's why I can't – I don't place blame on them. Because I truly believe they are trying to do the best. Like, I can only imagine what it's like to be a parent and their kids having an issue, whether it be medically, mentally. That's one, there's so much self blame that probably goes on. And also, just, you know, it's expensive to try and figure out what's wrong with your kid. There's so much emotion that goes into being a parent. And the world really doesn't support it either. So I just think that um, for me, there's just a mutual understanding of they understand that maybe that wasn't the right place for me. And I understand that they were trying to just do the best they could. So. Do you think it helped you? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know because if you look at a lot of the kids that went there, most of them are like, not doing great. There's only a couple that I would say a lot of them have died. A lot of them are right? in, yeah, whether it be suicide or overdose, a lot of them had gotten pregnant right after they graduated. 
Um, some of them have like multiple children with multiple different, you know, unstable relationships. And then there's like a few that have really pulled themselves out of like basically being re-traumatized or going through that experience and not really been given any tools to actually (laughs) succeed in the adult world because they don't really give you those there. And so other than that, like, you know, a lot of people are in and out of jail, never really did anything with themselves. Some got pregnant too early or, and some are, um, passed away. A lot of them. There's only a handful of, um, that have, have done something with themselves. Do you want to be a parent? Um, I think for me, uh, I'm 36 years old and I just feel like if I'm supposed to do that, it'll happen. But I also am at a place where I just, I don't know if I would want to raise a child in this world, if that makes sense. It makes sense. But, you know, I mean, if I, if I think if you, if I got blessed with that, that would be great. I just, it's not like my focus, I guess. But you're not, it's not because you're worried that you might have a child who it would be very difficult to raise or. I think it would be difficult to raise any child. It is. I think I don't, it, it doesn't difficult. matter if your child is the most brilliant, perfect, whatever. It's Every so hard got to something. be a parent. Every kid's got something. I'm not worried about that because like, I just feel like, you know, I really do feel like I would be a good mom. I just think I'm worried about the other things and what it means to be a child and what it means to be a child in the world today. And like all, like we didn't have the same fears growing up. Like, you know, the school Look, shootings scare me. I was about me. to just say, they're doing active shooter drills yeah, at our kids' schools. I didn't have schools, that. Well, the first which school is traumatizing shooting, the first school kids. shooting I experienced, I was in fifth grade and that's when Columbine happened. Okay. But even then we weren't doing school shooting right. drills because it wasn't like, oh, this is going to happen all the time. We just thought yeah. these were like isolated incidents. But like that stuff, we, you know, I still remember when we did earthquake drills. Yeah. Like those were scary. Like knowing, like I'm trying to understand deathly weather, you know? So um, also the internet, that stuff worries me. I don't like that kids are raised on the internet. There's just pictures of them out there, you know? So it's, it's a different world. I think you have to have like, I don't know, a lot of just a lot of love and a lot of money <laughs> and a lot of therapy. So I don't know about the money part. Yeah. No, I didn't grow up with money. I had well, it was a different time then. I also had hate, but there was love. Yeah. yeah. It was a different time then. But honestly, like as a parent, the biggest thing you can do is be there. Mm-hmm. Be there. And whatever they're into, fucking go full force into but supporting it. You don't you have, have to like it. You have to have to when I say a lot of money, I mean it up in a place where you're able to give the kid that time you're probably doing well financially hopefully right i mean what do you mean like little league getting free no i mean just like (laughs) i'm just like i'm just like no no no. i mean like i just i mean like you know having a job but also like it's not not that you're so overworked that you can't give the the kid that Listen, time to here's the thing if you love anything the way you love comedy yeah you're gonna find comedy time for comedy in your day if you add a child to that mix you will find time for if you're a good parent you'll yeah. find time for that child and but you don't you think you kids are expensive they are they're yeah. crazy expensive that's more of yeah, like they're the concern. crazy expensive it's like kids are it's it's a, i think yeah it's and like, not just medical bills and stuff like no backpacks yeah they grow yeah. They grow. I just bought my daughter a size one shoes. She's already a one and a half. Like two yeah. months later, I'm like, damn, we got to get new shoes already, yeah. you know, clothes. That's why all I say that. like you have to f- have yes. – for me, it's like you have to have enough money to make sure that that kid has at least everything all the other kids have. Mm. Not – no, the basic stuff. Like basic, You know what sure. I mean? Like clothes. I'm not talking about the fancy stuff. Yes. Just that they have enough that they're not like – you know, I don't want a kid to – I don't want to be able to, to – to not be afford to give my kid that, you know what I mean? Like shoes, clothes, like at least what everyone else has at the bare minimum, you know, and like a good life. I don't, I want to be able to give, I would want to be able to give a kid at least a good life where they have all their basic needs met. 
Yeah, across my daughter. The line. My daughter. Listen, here's the thing about most kids: it's it, they have what they need. Yeah, it's the wants. Of course. That you have to temper. Mm -hmm. But what they really need that they don't know they need is that love, that validation, that attention. Like I try to – I high-five the shit out of my daughter on stuff. I'm like, good job, good job, good job. Because like you said, you just need – valid. I want to be validated. I'm not talking to you like you're a little kid. Like I'll give her real reasons. I don't ever say because I said so or because I'm the parent. I give her legit reasons. I go, well, this is why. And I break it down. Halfway through most of that, she's like, never mind. I'm like, well, there's the real reason. You don't want to hear that. I also think like, you know, there's the there's the participation trophy parents too, which yeah. I don't like either. It's like there's got to be a middle ground where, you know, if a kid brings home an A minus, that's still an A. You know what I mean? Like that's still a great job. You're still in the A bracket. <laughs> like, Don't ask the kid why they didn't get an A. You know what I mean? Like it's stuff like that where it's like, the little things like that kids need you to. You remember that, huh? Forever. Did you get Bs? Oh, yeah. Bs, Cs, Ds. Fs. Bs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you. It depends on, like, math was the worst. Me but too. English, history, all that other stuff. I always tested high, pun intended, but um, I, I was always testing like I was smart, but it just didn't reflect in school because of um, my learning, you know, differences. Now, what about your sister? Do you have a close relationship with your sister? Um, on and off, like we've we've been close and not close over the years, and um, a lot of that has been because I lived on the opposite side of the country, and you know, she went off to be a lawyer, and like her job she is, also is, huh? Yeah, she's you're the she, only one not. I know I'm, you're the only non-attorney in yeah. the family. Is that right? Hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, she went and followed in the in the footsteps of my parents. Your parents still together? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, she's – and she lives in Vegas with them. All right. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to go to college in Vermont? Did you just want to get way the hell away (laughs) from everything? Um, Was it a different start? That school that I went to is called Landmark College, and it's for kids who have learning differences such as ADHD, um, autism – um uh ADHD, ADD, um executive functioning, dyslexia is a big one. So you have to have a learning difference um to go there. Not that autism is a learning difference, but you you most a lot of the kids could be on the spectrum per se, because a lot of these run together co- um together. You can have multiple diagnoses. So you have to be diagnosed with a learning difference to go there. It's a two-year school in Vermont. And my parents thought it would be good for me because it's isolated <laughs> in a small town and there's oh, no so distractions. You didn't pick this. Um, no, not really. Like I, I think also I, I, I didn't have really the grades to go to us other schools. It was kind of one of my only options. And the whole thing is you go to the school for two years, you get your, you get good grades and y- you can go off to other colleges. So after I graduated there, I got into Northeastern and American and I ended up going to American. In SDC, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, my cousin went there for a yeah, little bit. Yeah, I went there for a year. Um, what was it like when you first were able to honestly, I don't mean to say it like this, but make your own decisions about life? Like you're out of this college now where no one had any um, say where you go next. Like mm-hmm. what was that like for you? I mean, very foreign because after being monitored for 13 months and literally having to ask permission to simply go to the bathroom, like everything you did, you had to get pre-approved. Um, I was still under that um, that feeling of like questioning myself. And again, I wasn't being validated for um, anything. It, I just felt very unsure. And a lot of it was, um, I'm lucky because When I got to Vermont, I had a boyfriend there and his mom worked at the college. Her name is Kim and she became like a second mom to me and she's super crunchy granola, like completely opposite of the people I was in in Utah with. And so her and her husband came became like this mom and dad that I emotionally never had like. And they were the ones who made me feel normal for the first time in my life that everything I had gone through and how I was feeling and almost made me be like, we don't even, you know, that medication, like almost like there's whatever is going on under that needs to be addressed. But the medication is just numbing you out, you know, and like who you are is okay. 
Lithiums, that's some heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. When did you finally stop taking that? Uh, I was I was twelve. I was only I was only on it for like a year or so. So I was twelve when That's I right, got put the on thyroid. it. But at that point, when I was in college, I was on like still on tranquilizers, still on mood stabilizers, still on all that stuff, Lexapro, all that, Seroquel, everything, Lamictal. Um, you know, so so basically, I for the first time in my life, when I got to college, I was meeting people who validated me. And I started to get good grades because I I was in a school that taught me how to learn because I I just didn't learn the same way that other like everyone learns differently in the school system, at least in America is catered to like one type of learner. And I knew I would I was told I was smart my whole life, but I didn't never felt smart because my grades never reflected that. And it wasn't until college that I actually start to like see myself as an as somewhat intelligent good mm -hmm. all right now after i told you at the end of this i would ask you advice that you would give to your 16 year old self so uh, i'm interested <laughs> to know now because that's that's right at that pivotal moment mm -hmm. for you what would you say to 16 year old rachel strap in <laughs> 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 I guess the shit's about to get buck wild, isn't it? Yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. Just uh, yeah, get good at being okay with being yourself. I guess that's great advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for doing this. I know that wasn't. Easy. I'm proud of you. Didn't oh, cry. Thank you. you didn't <laughs> I was like, I'm not gonna do you it. You did. You did good. <laughs> Um, so funny. Promote everything one more time, please. Um, at Rachel Wolfson on Twitter. Sorry, wrong. At Rachel Wolfson on Instagram. At Wolfie Comedy on Twitter. And RachelWolfsonComedy.com for my dates. And Wolfie DMs if you guys want to see all the naughty, nasty, funny, humbling <laughs> DMs that I get. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, as always, Ryan Sickler on all social media, ryansickler.com. Tacoma, I will see you this weekend. I'll talk to you all next week. Mm -hmm.